Paula Venels is said to have earned £2.2 million during her time at the post office, spanning the years of the Horizon software scandal, much of which was made up of incentive bonuses, both short and long term, linked to business incentives, many of which are said to be linked to the private prosecutions of sub-postmasters during the software scandal. So for those of you that are not sure, particularly international viewers, the Horizon software scandal was essentially where there were several bugs with the software called Horizon, which would misreport fictitious losses for which the sub-postmasters of the post office were then pursued financially and even prosecuted for fraud, theft, false accounting, and many of them went to prison. Now, a high court case in 2019 brought all of the truth around the software. But coincidentally, Paula Venels left the post office in 2019 reportedly with uh, pay and bonuses in the tune of £400,000, along with a CBE. She's since decided to return that CBE after 1.2 million odd people voted that she should return it or that she should be removed from that CBE. But many calls are now demanding that she return the bonuses. So in this video, let's take a look at whether that is at all possible. So let's move first of all to one of the post office's own documents, which is an annual report from 2013. Now, there are several bits of this that are useful to look at. Um, first of all, this clawback provision, which is within this document. It says here that executive directors have a clawback clause in the contracts, as well as the short term incentives and the long term incentive rules which provide for the return of any overpayments in the event of a misstatement of the account, errors, gross misconduct on the part of the executive. These provisions are in line with market best practice. Now, interestingly, this document also talks about training and development programs which have been put in place to support ambition, create high performance, customer oriented sales culture. And this ambition is further supported by a range of bonus schemes which are based on the achievement of business targets. Such business targets also included, as I read, the reduction of losses in inverted commas, which no doubt related to sub postmasters and losses which ultimately didn't really exist. This report also discusses directors remuneration including that of Paula Venels, with target awards of £175,000 and stretch awards of £245,000. Now, whilst handing back the CBE was probably the least that she could do, many people have criticised that because they say that was too easy and, in effect, didn't really cost her anything. And as some have noted, it may not even be effective because whilst she may declare that she is handing it back, it is only the king that can authorise the return of a CBE and in any event obviously doesn't cost her anything to do so. So therefore many people are calling for the return of the bonuses that she earned during that period which could amount to six if not seven figures over the period that she was in office. Looking back again at this document here this clawback provision could relatively easily in my view be invoked for at the very least misstatement of the accounts because those accounts were reflecting so-called profits from the fictitious losses that were accrued over that time which is at the very least a misstatement of those accounts. Secondly, those accounts and many reports were obviously full of errors during that time and whether Paula Venels and perhaps other executives are liable for gross misconduct is something that may come out of the current inquiry. Either way, it is entirely possible within the terms of their contracts of employment at the requisite time that any and all of these incentive payments could well be clawed back. Now, very often there's a phrase that I coin which is system and reality. The system being how things could and should work and the reality as to what really happens. Now, I do hope that if it is decided that there was gross misconduct by any of the executives during this period that caused misery to so many sub postmasters, wrongly prosecuted, wrongly imprisoned, wrongly had their lives ruined financially and in any other sense possible, some of whom being sent to prison while they were pregnant, this is an utter disgrace. So I would say at the very least, if it is upheld that there was any gross misconduct on the part of any of the executives in office at the time of this scandal, that each and every one of these incentive payments that is in any way linked to any of these prosecutions could 
and very much should be clawed back. Let's also not lose sight of the fact that some very simple questions, in the judge's words, took years and many tens of millions of pounds in costs to reach an answer. This one section of the Bates judgment from 2019 in particular was an internal email chain discussing the remote accessibility of the Horizon software. Could it be accessed or could it not be accessed? This was something that quite clearly frustrated the judge. Let's take a look at a few snippets from that judgment that highlight this frustration. At paragraph 520, the judge says another document from 2015 upon which the claimants rely is an internal email chain, which originated from Paula Venels, the then chief executive of the post office, on the 30th of January 2015. This was prior to her appearance before the House of Commons Select Committee in February 2015. She posed the following question in an email sent internally to Mark Davis and Leslie Sewell, both of the post office. Dear both, your help please in answers and in phrasing those answers in prep for the select committee. One, is it possible to access the system remotely? We are told it is. What is the true answer? I hope it is that we know that this is not possible and that we are also to explain why that is. I need to say no, it's not possible and that we are sure of it because of X. And we know this because we've had the system assured. Emphasis by the judge there. Miss Venels obviously needed to know the answer matched her understanding, which was, as she put it, both I hope and I need, that it was not possible to access the system remotely. This query was passed on through various people, including at one stage to James Davidson, who is both a Fujitsu and post office email address, who answered to Mark Underwood. As discussed, can you hook up with Kevin to review what answers have already been provided to second sight, as this should form the post office response. The answer was provided by Mark Underwood on the 30th of January in an email, which was part of the same email chain or string. Can post office or Fujitsu edit transaction data without the knowledge of a postmaster? Looking at paragraph 554 here, the judge says here, I find it notable that the truth did not emerge in the first Fujitsu witness statements that were originally served for the Horizon Issues trial. Such statements stated as the evidence in chief of witnesses of fact. They are supposed to be accurate. Then the judge goes on to discuss minor corrections, which often happens. Minor corrections, the judge says, are not unusual and indeed are almost expected as trial approaches, as witnesses either research further or remember when preparing for trial, or other minor details. This topic, however, did not undergo that type of correction and is a subject far more central and important than that. The truth only finally emerged in later statements, which were required to correct what I find were directly inaccurate statements in the first witness statements of Mr. Goddesseth and Mr. Parker. And here's a very important bit here that involves Paula Venels. The judge said, there has been no adequate explanation for the contents of those first witness statements, which not only omitted this important fact, but contained evidence directly to the contrary. Those first witness statements were misleading. The statement in the defence was misleading too. It ought also to be noted that the truth did not emerge initially within the post office in the email answers provided to internal inquiries in 2015 by senior post office personnel, such as the chief executive, who posed the specific question in preparation for providing evidence to a select committee and asked, what is the true answer? She also said in the same email, the judge goes on to quote, I hope it is that we know this is not possible and that we are able to explain why that is. The true answer, the judge says, is that contrary to her aspiration, it was possible. The judge goes on. She also stated, I need to say no, it is not possible and that we are sure of this because of X and that we know this because we have had the system assured. The true answer to that was also, yes, it is possible. At paragraph 548, there is another relevant feature in this case, which is that the generic defense also includes a counterclaim seeking damages against the sub-postmaster claimants, including damages for fraud. Fraud is the most serious allegation that can be brought in civil litigation, and there are special rules in relation to pleading it, which means that a pleading containing a fraud allegation should be subject to a particular scrutiny before it is served. Essentially, that means there has to be evidence of that fraud and there has to be, as a lawyer, there has to be specific instructions based upon that evidence in order to allege fraud, even in a civil trial. Let me know what you think in the comments and as always, thank you for watching.